I'm Larry Fedorik, and this is Later That Same Life. This episode marks the beginning of Season 2 of my weekly podcast, covering a variety of topics through storytelling. Feedback and topic suggestions are always welcome. I will share the email at the end of the episode. Also, you can help grow this podcast by sharing it with at least one friend. Thanks. Season 2, Chapter 1, Democracy. Democracy is under attack. Can democracy survive? If I can't answer that question in this podcast, at the very least, I hope to give you the tools to have a great discussion. Maybe get a little closer to an answer for yourself. I will look at eight major areas. The octopus that's choking democracy. Let's start with the basic definition of democracy, the bare-bones definition. A system of government by the whole population or all of the eligible members of a state, typically through elected representatives. Sounds simple enough. The will of the people. Now, the people will not always agree. So what now? Well, majority rules. How's that? So, what's the problem? Let's start here. Democracy depends on the active participation of the people. And the easiest and simplest form of that participation is voting. Get out and vote for one of those people who have stepped forward and said they would like to be your elected representative in government. So here's where we start on why the system of democracy is vulnerable. A great many eligible members of the state, the voters, don't vote. If voter turnout was 100% or even 90, the government and representation would look much different. Let's start with Canada as an example. These numbers are approximate but pretty close. We have about 36 million people in Canada. About two-thirds are eligible to vote i.e. Canadian citizens 18 or older on election day. So that's about 24 million people. On election day, federally, about two-thirds of those eligible to vote actually show up to vote. And that's on a good year. Turnout usually hovers around 60%. Two-thirds would be considered a great turnout. How pitiful is that? So now we're down to 16 million people. In 2015, Justin Trudeau won a clear majority with just under 40% of the popular vote, which means about 6.5 million of those voters said, yep, that's our guy. 6.5 million people determined government. Again, population of Canada, 36 million. The will of the people? In the United States in 2020, they had a record turnout of voters. 159 million people marked a ballot for president. And you know what? That's about two-thirds of their eligible voters. Both Trump and Biden broke Obama's record for most people to vote for a president. Biden's total just over 80 million. And that is about one-third of eligible voters. So by the math, in the U.S., about two-thirds of the voters, and I get that not all of them showed up to vote, but two-thirds might feel, that's not my president. In Canada, it's almost 75% who might feel, that's not my prime minister. The will of the people. To be clear, not voting is the umbrella issue of saving democracy. So let's break it down. The key to why democracy, as most of us know it, is in question. The majority of the people, members of the state, the citizens, do not feel represented. Now, the person you voted for may have gotten in somewhere as a representative, a member of a minority in the House, or the loyal opposition. Hey, it's not always going to go your way. Your side is not the ruling government, but, uh, you know, you're part of the checks and balances group. Some might say, well, that's democracy in action, and that's true. But I still feel a big problem today is that with our current system of voting, most people do not feel represented. I think that's one of the reasons people don't vote. 
It's a bit of a vicious circle, but they say, why bother? It's not going to make much of a difference. And they're all the same anyway. Let's deal with that second one first. Our mistrust and general lack of respect for politicians. I think we were raised that way. Let me ask you this question. When you were in your teens, were you counting down the days until you were old enough to vote? No, of course you weren't. You were counting down the days until you were old enough to drive. Maybe you were counting down the days until you were old enough to legally go into a pub or a bar. Drink responsibly. Make sure you always have your ID on you. And you did for a long time until that one day when you realized that no one had ID'd you for years. As a matter of fact, the kid at the checkout just called you sir. Oh, crap. When did that happen? Suddenly, we're a bunch of sirs and ma'ams walking around bitching about the government and not voting. I imagine some families had political discourse over the supper table. But for many families, that consisted of one of your parents yelling out things like, Ah, the guy's a crook. Politicians consistently ranked at the bottom of the list. Used car salesman, radio disc jockey, politician. People not smart enough to do anything else. I think that's a dialogue and a belief system that exists beneath the skin of many people. And you know, for every 100 smart and dedicated politicians, it only takes one Nixon for people to stand up and say, I told you so, they're all crooks. And why didn't your parents paint a rosier picture of democracy and your important role in it? Well, probably because of their parents and so on and so forth. Again, not everyone, but many. Democracy, the will of the people. We don't feel represented, and by and large, we don't think much of the people who say they represent us. Third issue. Democracy, generally speaking, is how we determine government and little else. Much of our lives are largely dependent on business as opposed to government. Business is mostly autocratic. We vote with our wallets. In business, voter turnout is always high. You know, because we need jobs and we need to pay for things. And because it's our wallet, it's more meaningful to us. More direct results. We see them every day as money goes in, goes out. A lot of people will say we should run government like we run a business. Well, business is actually the opposite of government. That's why they are usually at odds or trying to get the other one in their pocket. Trying to run one like the other would not bode well for either. Government v. Business. Now, fourth issue. We don't trust the entire political system, never mind the individual politicians. We don't trust it, not implicitly. A number of voices today are suggesting we need less government. Are those people in the majority? I don't think so, but they sure are loud. I will grant that governments are notorious for inefficiencies, wasteful spending, misappropriations et al. But less government? That means less representation. I believe a lot of people confuse less government with less bureaucracy. They say they want less government, but what they really want is less hassle when it comes to government services. I think if you take the two top political parties in this country, that their leaders are stuck in an old colonial mindset, like somehow they were appointed and anointed to govern the new world. Listen, I do not want to be governed. The government's motto, regardless of politics, should be the same one as the police, to protect and to serve. I don't want less government. I want better service. Let's continue. Why is democracy now some existential question? Next problem, the arrival of identity politics. Identity politics not only describes creating an identity around a candidate, that's age-old, but identifying you by your politics. These days, your belief system just doesn't identify how you think. It now identifies who you are, and therefore you are going to fall on the right or wrong side of something. Tribes have replaced communities. Cancel culture hangs over your every decision. 
the social guillotine. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. Hey, man, I just want to know what's going on. The next big issue is less than two decades old. Think about that, because democracies have been attacked several times over the centuries. But now, we are all connected. Hey, it's all wonderful, and many of us are still enamored of this new toy, but in my opinion, we cannot underestimate the connected effect on every aspect of our lives. Sometimes I feel like we should just give in. Who is the new leader of our nation? Well, who has the most likes on Facebook? Who's got the most retweets? Uh, you? Okay, good, congratulations. Next election, tomorrow. Which actually leads me to the next problem. Elections are every four or five years. In Canada, it can even be less than that federally. In the U.S., they have something called midterms. In most modern democracies, the first thing you do when you get elected to government is to begin the process to become re-elected. We are constantly in an election cycle. Too much. Whether we realize it or not, we are. We just go through periods of fewer lawn signs, that's all. I'm sure we've all experienced someone in a workplace who spends most of their day covering their ass. You know, because there was always people who did their jobs and others who just protected their jobs. More and more, it seems that politicians fall into that latter category. Ass-covering, brown-nosing politicians whose reason for existing is to get re-elected. No good. Now, I'm not suggesting we elect governments for 10 years or 20 years, because that wouldn't work either. But it sure is hard to plan long-term for a future survival when you're always in an election cycle. What we have to do is start voting based on accomplishments versus most lawn signs. We say we do, but do we really? And the questions we should be asking when it comes to policies and promises in this order are, what will benefit the most people? Secondly, what will harm the fewest people? And then way down in third, what's in it for me? Final problem, at least according to my list on this podcast. Democracy is under attack by the bad actors, despots, communists, princes, kings, and trumpians who attempt to convolute democracy and the will of the people for personal gain and agenda. Largely, they are conservative aristocracy who saw the cracks in the system, and they knew that aristocracy is incompatible with democracy. Some create the illusion of democracy. I can sum that up in three words. Elections in Russia. You know what that is, by the way? That's Russian for get out and vote. You put this all together, and we are right to question democracy's survival. Canada and the U.S. were formed on the principles of democracy. We have spent our existence nuancing it, and that's great. You know, painting and decorating certainly gave us some pleasant surroundings for all these years. But it's time for a major reno. Gotta start knocking down some walls and rebuild. You know, we've seen revolutions around the world, people taking to the streets for democracy. Sometimes those fail. I liken it to someone who has spent most of their life in prison and they finally get their freedom and often they end up right back inside. The outside world and freedom proved too much for them. Yeah, that's because it's not easy. Freedom doesn't just come with rights. It comes with responsibilities. Actually, the three R's, responsibilities, reason, and rights. I would love to hear more people recite their responsibilities instead of just blankly citing their rights. Democracy, in some form, has been around for over 2,500 years. As I said, we've nuanced it over time. But now, it needs a major fix. How? I don't want to make this podcast all about voting reform, but it is a key to many of the issues. 
Our system now is called first past the post. In other words, the most votes wins. Ranked ballots are the way to go. They have been used at various levels around the world, most recently for the Democratic nomination for candidate for mayor of New York City. At least hearing talk of a ranked ballot system gives us some hope. So on a ranked ballot, when you vote for a person, you vote for your first choice, then your second choice, third choice, and so on down the ballot. After all the voting, the counting of the votes can work in a couple of different ways. And I'm not going to explain the whole thing. I mean, it's not complicated, but it does sound so at first. It's certainly more complicated than most votes wins. In some ranked ballot systems, you can actually elect more than one person to represent your constituency. The case against ranked ballots is, well, it can appear to be more government, and that it is a little more complicated, and it's new and scary to many people. It requires more to be a knowledgeable voter in a time when we already have turnout as an issue. But the case for most people would be better represented in government. Some politicians have actually run on the platform promise of election reform, including our current Canadian Prime Minister. I guess he forgot. The issue as I see it is, once you're in, why would you change a system that got you into power to a system that might diminish some of that power and return it to the people? Ranked ballots would plug a lot of holes through which democracy is being attacked, people would feel more and actually be more represented, leading to a greater confidence in the people and the system, theoretically leading to more people voting, leaving less room for the bad actors. Yeah, that's plugging a lot of the holes. Spin doctors, politicos, marketers, have figured out how to manipulate the the first-past-the-post system. They know how to get the most votes for the win. And eventually, they might figure out how to manipulate the ranked ballot system as well. But, overall, the change would do us good. I don't see it happening anytime soon. It takes time. As I said, recently it came up in the New York mayoral race. That's good for America. Maybe we can start introducing it at a local level. Maybe with school board elections, etc. See how it works. See how we like it. Grow the system. Change usually happens after one of two things. Will or necessity. A lot of people are talking a good game right now, fight for democracy, save democracy, but the will to actually change it for the better so that it works for a modern society doesn't seem to be there. Necessity is sometimes born out of an emergency. Hopefully, it's not going to get to that before we wake up. The recap. Democracy in question because we don't feel represented We don't like the politicians. Business is government's enemy. We don't trust the system. Identity politics, social media. We're always in an election cycle. And bad actors. A lot of big things have to happen. Big changes. But here's one easy one. We can all contribute. It's the umbrella issue. People have to vote. I'll repeat what I said earlier. If voter turnout was over 90%, you'd see a different government, a different system. Here's an oldie but a goodie. Politicians don't talk to the people. They talk to the people who vote. Imagine if everyone voted. Don't you think you'd hear some different political speeches? At the very least, some new rhetoric. Here's a quick side note. Did you know the elections that affect us most directly, the civic elections, councillors, mayors, etc., they have the least turnout. Provincial and state, a little higher. Federally has the highest. And remember, that's still low. Voting is not the only fix for democracy, but it's the one you can do, and it would go a long way. Remember the definition? Democracy is a system of government by the whole population. 
not two thirds. Later That Same Life is a weekly podcast series written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedorik. A new episode every Thursday. LarryFedorik37 at gmail.com.